now we resort to ad hominem arguments. I, I would never come across, or I've never come across an instance where he resorts, uh, resorts to a straw man argument. He never belittles the other person. Uh, he never denigrates them. Uh, uh, he never self-aggrandizes himself. He, he never does that. He is the epitome of the, uh, of the scholar of fairness and objectivity uh, with that most beautiful heart and most beautiful akhlaq uh, that uh, would not use the middle way as a sword. Hmm? Would not use the middle way as a sword. Meaning what? As this is the middle way and you are now excluded from the middle way. Because yes, it can be used as a sword. Everything could be used as a sword. Uh, but we find that Imam An-Nawi has this big embracing heart uh, and scholarly, scholarly insight, and very fair and very impartial, very fair and very impartial, something which is so necessary, especially because our discussions of middle way often have to do with pluralism and outreach and dialogue. But oftentimes, I, we, may forget that in-house hmm? when dealing with one another, when dealing with different perspectives within the camp of Muslims, we forget that oftentimes very opportunistically, but yet we speak about, more generally, pluralism from beyond. But Imam al nawawi was an example of that scholarship, rahimahullah. Uh, Mulana Ta once said after he, probably you would know his biography, my teacher, uh, our teacher, uh, after he graduated from Dioban and he graduated the first in his class, uh, he had mentioned that after he graduated, he said to himself that the ilm that I learn, I want it to build bridges. I don't want to use it to divide. I want to use what I learned to build bridges and not to divide. And lastly, the last theme, a body, so we did his heart, we did his mind, a body dedicated to welfare and service and confronting the needs of the age, the consummate engaged scholar. Uh, he was loved, uh, amply loved by the elite, by the ulama and by the common people. He had a very simple, austere life, and he was accessible. He lived a life without heirs. Uh, in the latter part of his life, secondly, we mentioned that he had written many books. And many of those books, when you actually look at them, they're written for public consumption, to address public needs. Let's take one of them, Riyadh al-Salihin. Um, as you know, on ethics, manners, and character. And it's written in a very accessible way, with very easy to follow index, if you like. So if you wanted to know anything about manners or character, uh, the heart of the prophetic legacy, you can do that very easily. And he follows a very beautiful approach in that what? And it's the first, it's the first that I know that actually does that in the, field of, uh, you know, in the field of ethics. He would tie the ayat to the hadith. So under each bab, he would bring the relevant ayat of the Quran, and then he would select very beautifully uh, and powerfully uh, in, in, in the most pithy and, and, and coherent way, the, 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 the most important ahadith that pertain to that bab. And it's a very, very comprehensive book. As a matter of fact, some have argued, and it would not be ba'id, it would not be far-fetched, that he is probably the most well-read current contemporary Muslim scholar. Every house has a copy of Riyadh al-Salihin. Every mosque, every masjid has a copy of Riyadh al-Salihin. Secondly, his Arba'een, his 40 hadith. Many ulama endeavored to compile 40 hadith with a view to summarizing and giving us a summation of the most important principles and the essential bedrock of our deen. Uh, history has not recorded any of them except his. And the Arba'een of Imam al nawawi continues to be studied and recited and taught numerous commentaries written about it. But that idea, that, 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 that bird's eye, clear-minded, transparent heart, was able to look at the shara in all its beauty and complexity and choose 40 hadith, a hadith which most succinctly summarize uh, the heart and soul uh, of the sharia. Ah. Al-Adhkar, uh, a book on, on supplications. Uh, the seeker to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connecting his or her heart to Allah through dua uh, and, and many other fawaid in terms of ethics and so forth included but again a book written for for us for me and for you students of ilm and then 
Al-Maqasid, which is a basic manual in fiqh, uh, not any of the mutawalat, the, the, you know, the large, uh, extensive, very legal, uh, legally written, uh, sort of legal ease language of the fuqaha, but something concise and, and condensed and, and workable and digestible for all of us. And then thirdly, his fairness, his social justice, uh, his standing for the rule of law, transparency and accountability. There are many instances of that. He was a socially engaged scholar. His, his altercations with Al-Zahir Baybars, who was the Mamluk ruler of the time, are legendary. Uh, for example, the imposition of unfair tax on the people of Damascus. And Imam Nawawi was the one that wrote the letter. Uh, he had it delivered, hand-delivered to the uh, Sultan. He represented not only the schools of fiqh, fiqh but the, the, the populace in Damascus. And he was reprimanded, and he was threatened, and he did not recant. He said, threats uh, I'm not afraid of. It is my obligation to stand for giving goodwill and advice to the rulers. Uh, and lastly, um, he was physically brought between, uh, before the Sultan, Al-Zahir Babers, because he refused, to, he refused to endorse a fatwa uh, permitting the taxing of the Damascene citizens for the purpose of fighting the Mongols. Uh, he was one of the ulama that refused, and he was physically brought before the audience of the Sultan. And he told the Sultan directly, you know, how about this for speaking the truth to power in a time where the state is under siege externally? And you know, in those, state, you know, in, in those states of emergency, uh, how civil liberties are lost uh, and how uh, authority runs roughshod. So he was asked, and, 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 and Imam al nawi held his ground, and he said, no. He said, you have many slaves, and you uh, clothe them with gold. If you first clothe them with normal clothes, sell that gold for the, uh, for the purposes of, of war and defense, then I will permit and only permit the, uh, the imposition of levies or taxes on the people of Damascus. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to learn and to benefit from this alim who represented the very best and the most beautiful tradition of our scholarly legacy. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our thanks to Mawlana Riya Saluji um, for taking over that slot. And that certainly um, sets up the bar very high for our ulama to follow up on uh, in future from here. We now have our respondent, Dr. Andrea Brigalia, who lectures in Islam at the University of Cape Town. And uh, he'll take about 10 minutes for his response before we take some of your questions. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa huwa al-awwal al-akhir wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa huwa al-Fatihu al-Khadimu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. I thank uh, the organizer of this uh, symposium for inviting me and especially Dr. Uwais Rafuddin who has uh, kindly invited me to share um, uh, listening to the listening to this uh, respected uh, uh, speakers today. Um, uh, uh, at the same time, I regret not responding to Maulana Taha Kiran, but at the same time, as uh, the learned people of uh, in, the, in a popular proverb in my country say, everything you miss is, every, is something you get. So I'm pleased at the same time to have had the opportunity to listen to a reminder about the life of one of the most uh, respected scholars of uh, Islam and of humanity at large, as uh, Imam al Nawawi from uh, Sheikh uh, Saluji. Um, so um, I don't think I have uh, a lot to respond to that, what to say after a reminder about the life of uh, Al-Imam al-Nawawi. Um, uh, maybe I, um, I would like to spend maybe two or three, only two or three minutes just to point to uh, what is at the same time I feel from my very little experience one of the salient virtues of uh, traditional Islamic scholarship, but it is also, which is also one of most, the most difficult things to maintain in contemporary um, uh, times. And so the ones that have been always troubled in, 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 in trying to find a middle way of how to, 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 to preserve that, 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 that legacy. Uh, my very short, unfortunately, experience with traditional Islamic learning in uh, northern Nigeria tells me that one of the things that make his traditional Islamic learning so wasat in a way is the fact that uh, 
it gives you time as a student. It doesn't impose a time over you, but it follows your time. Uh, when I was, uh, and I say again, for, unfortunately for only for a few months, exposed to studying with uh, one of my teachers, uh, Malan Bashir Buhari Arumi in Kano, I, I regret those few hours in the day when you would sit and uh, there was no time imposed on you. You must not cover that curriculum over a specific amount of time. You sit, there's other students, everybody reads a few lines in Arabic from the book he's reading, somebody's reading a book on fiqh, somebody's reading a book on hadith, somebody's reading a book on aqidah. There's no even confines about the different topics. And, and on, on his turn, everybody learns, uh, t l uh, reads a few lines, and the teacher sits, corrects what you, learn, what, what you have read, if you have done any mistake in reading, and gives you a translation and an explanation and a commentary. And often the commentary also uh, brings uh, in some uh, uh, matters and events from daily life, something that happens around you. These sessions used to take place in front of his house, so there would always be somebody walking so that he could point some, to some good behavior in the person walking on some bad behavior in, 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 the, in the world, in the people around us. So there was no time limit. We would sit there and, 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 and learn. I think this is one of the things that might have helped for many generations in the people who have uh, come before us to produce that cool, calm, collected mind of which uh, Sheikh Saluji was talking about, that um, heart connected to Allah that heart connected to God, because the heart sometimes is distracted from God when uh, uh, time constraints are imposed over you. And that soft, sweet tongue, that uh, uh, approach of you know, forgiveness, rahma, everybody has his own time. Uh, the teacher would not uh, 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 um, uh, slap you for your mistakes, would, would, would let you take your time. Somebody would be able to cover a book in a month, and the same book, uh, somebody else would be able to cover it only in, in a year. So this, this is the thing that I recollect with uh, a lot of, uh, of, of nostalgia and of admiration of that uh, approach to the study of Islamic learning. At the same time, is one of the problems that, I've, uh, uh, that, 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 that haunts me when I discuss with people today. How do we uh, keep that legacy on? When, whenever we have to structure our classes, in a way, we cannot but uh, uh, follow the, the, the needs of the time. And the needs of the time, we, we are not the ones who decide them. This time we live in, the society we live in, imposes us a certain more, a certain more structured way of approaching time that sometimes can, a lot can be lost even if we do a lot of uh, efforts in, in, in studying the right books, in studying Imam Nawawi, in studying the right disciplines. So this is, is something that, that, that may be uh, one of the first questions that I want to ask, uh, um, uh, just to, to share the, this, this discussion with, 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 with the speaker, is um, even if we, we choose the right books to study, we choose the right authors, we choose the right disciplines, how can we reproduce that very specific relation with time that uh, probably was so important in nurturing that habits that in, in the heart. How can we do that? This is the only thing that, that I want to share with you um, after thanking you for inviting me and uh, opening up maybe a discussion on, on this very tremendous topic. As we know that the deen is transmissions, as the ulama have said. So transmitting this legacy is, 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 is definitely uh, a very important, important uh, uh, part of it. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My question is firstly. Yes. Uh, yes. All right. So that that's the first question. We'll have Dr. Um, Riyaz answer, or rather, um, Mona Riyaz answer, and we'll also take a few questions from the floor. We'll try and go for about another five or ten minutes, and thereafter we'll break for tea, and we'll move across uh, to the cafeteria. Uh, but first, though, um, uh, Mona Riyaz, the question was asked at you, so let's uh, get that answer, please. بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ومن ولا Actually, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, the only thing that comes to mind actually is one of my one of my teachers um, when he uh, when he advised uh, uh, some of us to go and study. Uh, then uh, you know, we'd never conceived that we would be studying 
in, in South Africa, in Africa, on the tip of Africa, in Cape Town, in Strand, uh, as they say lovingly in the bush. <laughs> um, you know, we never really conceived of that. And, and, you know, when we spoke to him about, well, you know, it's a big life move, he said, it's not like in the old days where you would take, f you know, four months to go by, by, um, by ship. Y you fly there, and if it's not good, you fly back. Uh, and you take as long as you want. And you take as long as you want and as long as you need. Uh, and then from time to time I would call him to say, you know, these are the subjects, what else do I have to do, what else do I have to do? Then he would say, do that and that and that. And it, it ended up being more time. Uh, and then, you know, if there's an opportunity to teach a course, then he'd go, well, teach them all. <laughs> <laughs> if you can do that, teach them all. And I said, well, that's going to take probably six years. So be it. <laughs> uh, I still don't know. <laughs> I'm still um, grappling with that, inshallah, something that I will give some thought to, but just to share some of those anecdotes, that, that there are some of us that do think like that still, mm. uh, and there are some of us that find it difficult to accept it. Mm. I'm not sure whether that answered the question, but it certainly, I think a lot of us, me dealing with time, it certainly does come into play. Questions from the floor, please. Any questions? All right. Assalamu <coughs> alaikum. Can a means a question for what you could tell you to see? Can I? Can I? The most important thing in Islam is reality. No, I can buy you out. The second part of the name is the name of Allah. How can a means live with Allah? Can you? Why is it so? Ik kan het met beschadigd Ik kan niet arp verstaan, ik kan niet recht bachen, ik kan niet meer fik niet. En ik is niet in dag jou uit. Nou, ik het test gegaan van ik het kennis. Je spreekt bij het nabouwe. Je houdt dit nabouwe, wie komt daar van de ABC? Wie van ons is gepaas, toch hier? ABC, mm. fik ABC, maar was het degrees bij de university. Was maar geen teachers om je kennis te leren, misschien 5% Arabic. En was het scholen, in Masita moest ook gaan maken voor scholen, gaat dat in Masita ook maken. We speak here language. Maar ga je verstaan in de straat niet. Je gaat een exempel geven. Ik heb een man gehad, hij heeft gewerkt bij de council. Toen zei ik voor mijn moslim, toen zei ik ja. Toen zei ik, hij is getrouwd. Toen ken je, als je de Allah, je daar in de man. Toen zei ik voor Ash, die stof van u. Toen leer ik hem een week, als je de Allah, je daar in de man. We praten een language wat nobody understands. Wenn ich sage, brav Freitag, und ich gehe wieder, das ist eine andere Welt. Because ich ist das ein Mensch in die Straße. Boudai, ich will sagen, Trama Kassi, für die Frage, das ist eine sehr gute Frage, was gefragt ist. I'm not going to try and translate, can I? Kann ich uns nicht die Frisch sagen, Frau, um die Antwort auf die Frage? Boudai, Trama Kassi. Sheikh Siraj, could I? Das ist eine gute Frage, das ist eine Frage. Das ist eine Frage, das ist eine Frage, das ist eine Frage, das ist eine Frage. So, komm uns Frau, dass Sheikh Siraj, was vielleicht nicht Afrikaans verstehen, das bietet an. The gentleman is 90 years old, he poses a very good question. He says, how do you serve Allah? How do you love Allah when you don't know Allah? And he's talking about basic knowledge that is not getting through to people. Sheikh Siraj, can I toss that fourth question, as the Buddha says, uh, to you? And, and then we'll take it from there. So, answer on, on behalf of Mona Riaz. Assalamu you know, the first thing uh, I, on Friday in Majuma, I made it to Afo, one of our congregants who was 92 years old. And uh, what I would ask you, first of all, before even teaching you, is to ask you to make dua for us that we have a long life, inshallah. Yes. Sorry? Who? Okay. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I must be floating somewhere else. <laughs> With CFA, but I'm going to be able to Yes. MashaAllah. All right. MashaAllah. <laughs> but I don't eat now for the Sheikh and a black and a drug, so I must let the Sheikh go and go. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do I know? I love all of all. Allah. I am more concerned, you know. Um, there's a lovely Sufi, there's a Moy Sufi, the Sof saying, let's say that yeah, as you upstand in the Ochent, then don't worry what, um, about what you will be doing for the day worry about what Allah will think about what you will be doing. So it's a question from consciousness and taqwa and I hope I is a slaf in Allah, I is a raja wa khawf. Khawf fear of losing his presence and hope of gaining his presence. And uh, I can fra for myself some dua to make that I do gain nearness in Allah Ta'ala. But with ik van die ach mag in de Koran is, maak ik dua en ik zal voor beter dan vraag om voor mij dua te maak to help me along the way. In Allah you have the tawabin, wal mutawakilin, wal muksitin, the ach beloved to Allah. But I cannot for myself ever say that I know that Allah Ta'ala loves me. What I can say is I try my best to love Him. All right. Can we take, can we? Inshallah ta'ala. All right. So we, we, ta we take your point, but Adon, Jazakallah so much. Can we Shukran take another? I would like to have a key, though, no? <laughs> <laughs> Can we take a second question, please? Um, um, yes, Ma, just some um, commentary about the uh, first um, address, um, Sheikh Shiraj. Um, I'm listening to you. Most um, of what, what you're talking, it seems about intellectual talking. Um, it does not address the subject of the community finding the middle way. Mm. When we listen to the radio stations or the television stations or the Friday khutbah, it is predominantly about us versus them, the Muslims versus the Jews, the men versus the women, us versus the non-Muslims and there is a continuous preaching about the segregation and the separation of people and it is us that we must tell them what to do and if we don't tell them what to do and if they disagree with us then we must fight against them then we must kill again we must kill them and this this the the preaching of the ulama uh, differs vastly vastly from the practical reality in South Africa between men and women or between Muslims and non-Muslims so predominantly when I listen to the ulama, the talking does not align with the practical reality in the community or in the broader sense in the global community. Mm. What he briefly mentioned happening in the Middle East, in my opinion, is nothing to do with religion. It's about people politics, about people being oppressed, and people even using a religion. Just as much as the uh, part of the, uh, religion use Christianity to oppress people, there's a lot of people use religion to, to oppress people. All and right. that is not I'd the like, middle way. I'd like our two speakers to respond on that. Uh, um, um, yes, I think that is a very fair question because it also refers to what you were talking about. The bulk of, of, of Imam Nawawi's work was, did, was to the general man in the street. So how do we get that conversation, all of what we are talking here, to the general man in the street, make it appropriate for the, for the ordinary person? Um, look, one of the you know, one of the salient themes of Imam al Nawawi's life was that he wrote and he taught. Uh, he wrote in a way that was accessible and clear, and he addressed issues that were essentially needed by lay people, by us. Uh, and we mentioned some of that. He wrote on fiqh, and he taught basic fiqh, that people would know the basic rules of their deen. He compiled the book of Riyadh al-Salihin, which is what? Ethics and manners in order that we could live up to the ideals of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And all of this under the, the label of essential ilm. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to show loving worship and loving servitude and submission to him, ubudiya, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an says, hatta uh, liya'rifun, that we would know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order that we know him. But the only way to know him is, is by knowing what he wants. 
what he loves, what he does not love, what he wants us to do, what he does not want us to do. So at the level of fiqh, he wrote and he taught. At the level of ethics, he wrote and he taught. At the level of the adhkar, you know, what uh, to connect us to, again, to the prophetic legacy. What were those mo most importantly? Yes, definitely the adhkar and the litanies of our ulama are, are important, especially the salihun among them. But what about the Sayyidul uh, Salihin? Right? The, the greatest of the Salihin, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that was some, somewhat revolutionary in his time, to connect us with the words, with the prophetic pearls of wisdom, of address to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and, and to the Divine. So in, in, in the writing and in the teaching. And then with regard to his akhlaq, the akhlaq of the alim, is the same akhlaq and held to the same standard, meaning what? In the sense that the akhlaq is the akhlaq of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the standard is the same. Uh, the non-scholar, the student of, mm. of, 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 of ilm, and the scholar must abide by that. And scholars are accountable in that sense. If ulama falls short in terms of speaking with adl and fairness, in saying the same things privately and publicly, in speaking with moderation and balance and i'tidal, hmm? in speaking with, you know, without speaking in a foresight, uh, uh, with, with foresight, you know, without looking at the broader implications of their words, without uh, uh, understanding the foreseeable consequences of their words. One example of that would be the, the Muslim marriage bill and, and the debate, and some of the language around that debate was absolutely horrendous, right. repugnant, repulsive. You know, to suggest that some ulama were even kuffar or towing the lines of the kuffar. Violent, violent language. You know, that could not be supported uh, by any reference to the prophetic tradition and to the prophetic legacy. So well, those would be I standards in terms of the teaching, whether in terms of teaching physically, a word of mouth, in writing, addressing the issues of the day, and in being held, as we all are held, to the same standards mm -hmm. of character and being held accountable for that. All right. Um, a minute before we've got to go for a break, and I would like uh, uh, Dr. Andrea also to give his response, because this is also an international trend that we find that, that people are losing touch between the ulama on the one hand and the general public on the other hand, which is why media like ourselves have to try to play the middleman. How do we cross that divide? And there's also another thing that the last speaker has emphasized, which is very important. Sometimes there's a shift in our discussions, the middle way, uh, within the Muslim community, but there's also the other aspects that was present in some of the presentations from the one from Sheikh Siraj's presentation, which is the middle way as Muslims with the outer with the other communities. And I, I think that if we look back at the origins of Islam and the first revelation, a lot about the revelation of Islam was about being a middle community between two communities that at, at, at that time in Arabia were perceived as being kind of risking to fall into one of two extremism. At that time, we must remember the Jews had been expelled from Jerusalem and uh, the expulsions of the Jews from Jerusalem was by the hands of uh, Christians. I mean, they, the Christians had renewed an expulsions by the end of the Romans. And in the sixth century, just before the coming of Islam, a king from Yemen who had converted to Judaism had been at the Himyarid kingdom of, of, of Yemen, had done massacres of, of Christians at the same time. Islam came at that particular time when there were two communities which uh, in one way or another in the Middle East at that time were perceived as risking to follow into one narrow, one aspect of narrowness. The narrowness w w which the Jews were uh, um, 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 risking to follow into it was the narrowness of thinking that they were the only depository of, of, of truth and the narrowness that the Christians were risking to follow into it was the, was the narrowness of thinking that Allah, God, could manifest himself into one only manifestation, into one person, into one human being. At that time, Islam came with that, came with the Ummat and Wasatan, uh, uh, um, uh, especially because at that time in Arabia, rightly or wrongly, but probably rightly, the perception of the people was that there was 
this risk? Have we lost that, 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 that legacy? Mm. This is one of the things that we must ask ourselves. Are we moderate in our relations with other religious communities? Uh, we can talk about other ikhtilaf in between us, in between Muslims and being moderate in between, but are we really moderate in our relations with the, with the, with the other religious communities? Do other religious communities perceive us as being moderate, as not falling into, into extremism? It's a very important challenge that the last speaker has, has, uh, has uh, brought, and I don't have the answer, but I think that I want to, to, to suggest that this is one of the things that, that Muslims should always be very, very, very attentive to. And we're today. certainly going to explore that after the break. Okay, we can't just talk. That's not good either. So my throat is asking whether my neck was slaughtered. Let's go take a break or grab a cup of coffee. We'll come back in another 15 minutes, inshallah. Then we'll put the women in the spotlight and find out whether we are too conservative or too liberal where women are concerned. Looking forward to that one. Jazakallah to everybody who've made their way back. Hopefully they've uh, quenched their thirst and we're ready for the uh, final, the second and final session of uh, today's uh, Spring Symposium brought to you courtesy of the Shah Muhammad Trust as well as IPSA. In this next session, I am very pleased that I'm not the only female up here, that this time I have two ladies sitting with me. And um, in the next session, we're going to take a look at women in the middle challenging, and here comes the jawbreakers, hyper-liberalism and challenging ultra conservatism. Our first speaker is Safiya Surti. She is a graduate of Arabic and Islamic studies, currently completing her MA in Islam with a focus on gender, particularly women and ritual participation in Islamic law at the University of Johannesburg, where she also lectures part-time. And the response will come uh, immediately th thereafter by Sister Nafisa Patel, a graduate of IPSA, who is currently completing an honors in religious studies at the University of Cape Town. But first, let's go to uh, um, our first speaker for this session, and that is Sister Safiya Surti. Bismillah. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to begin by stating from the outset that I approach this topic not as an Islamic scholar or an expert of any kind but rather as a student, a gender activist, and quite simply as a woman who is trying to walk the middle way. There is, I believe, no better spokespeople for Muslim women as Muslim women ourselves. And therefore, I thank IPSA for extending this invitation to me, although I am quite humbled and hesitant to express my opinions on the same platform as such accomplished scholars, particularly my esteemed teacher, Sheikh Siraj Hendricks, with whom, not surprisingly, we have discussed this topic time and time again. It would be very easy and painstakingly cliche to approach a topic such as women in the middle with the usual bout of Islam has given women so many rights. This is both simplistic and does not meet the challenge of answering exactly why and how so many things have gone wrong with women and Islam. Instead, I wish to provide an overview of the new gender discourses in the tradition, a middle way approach by what is known as fiqh and nisa and reference to some examples of South African women treading the middle way. The past two decades have seen a great amount of work and research completed in the area of women and Islam, from hermeneutical reinterpretation to legal reform and cultural critiques. Never before has the issue of Muslim women been at the forefront of nearly all discussion about our tradition, especially in a post-9-11 world. Islamic discourse around gender has taken many forms, from the traditionalist insistence on equity between the sexes rather than equality, to Islamic feminist and reform movements which view Islam and modernity as compatible and not opposed. It would be impossible to speak about all the work done by the many contemporary scholars, so I very briefly focus on three feminist scholars who have worked on Quran, Hadith, and Fiqh, respectively. In doing so, I wish to highlight that Islamic feminism provides useful tools and methodologies for looking at and studying Islamic scriptural and textual sources in the contemporary society. It is not to suggest that Islamic feminism is the solution to women's problems, but that in seeking a way forward, the experiences and scholarship of all women from all walks of life must be studied and engaged with critically. Islamic feminist scholars like Professor Amina Wadud have focused on developing new methodologies for interpretation and contextualization of the sacred Quranic message. Whilst their deliberations have led them to divergent conclusions about the way women are represented in the scripture, with Wadud having, thank you, uh, in recent times openly stated that she disagrees with the Quran and has decided to walk away from it, with regard to some difficult passages, it is not, in my view, suitable to outrightly reject the painstaking and meticulous research undertaken by these women, simply because they arrived at a conclusion which challenges the core of orthodox Islam. 
Rather, their hermeneutical methodology should be studied and appreciated, for if employed by other scholars, could very well lead to radically different ends. Wadud in particular provides beneficial ways of looking at the Quran by studying the Quranic worldview. She contextualizes the Quranic passages dealing with women and gender and delves into linguistic analysis of words which are controversial or difficult. This is not to deny inherent contradictions in her work, particularly regarding her distancing herself from the Quran mentioned earlier and the misappropriation of hadith, um, or rather her selective usage of hadith, when in most of her works it does not feature or is given its due. The important point to note is that by approaching the Quran from this three-pronged approach, the interpretive possibilities are opened up for newer interpretations. An example is the theory set forth by another American scholar, Aziza Al-Hibri. She provides, in my view, one of the best readings of the contentious 434 or wife-beating verse by using the very same tools as Wadud, arriving not at the conclusion that the Quran is inherently unjust in this case, but that in responding to the context of its revelation, 434 was the best way at the time to curtail the practice of domestic violence. The more women who approach the Quran with sincerity, the greater the chance we have of moving towards the Quranic worldview of justice. The woman of the middle way thus approaches the Quran with absolute belief, as well as the knowledge that new contexts give rise to new readings. Other scholars have focused on Hadith literature, Saadiya Sheikh one amongst them. She has proposed critical rethinking of the study of Hadith to uninterpret the patriarchal readings which have since dominated the signs. It would be counterproductive to brush certain narrations which are, on the surface, not in harmony with the notion of gender equality, particularly the famous Naqisatul Akal or deficient in intelligence narration. How do we deal with these narrations without undermining the authority of Hadith um, as one of the twin bedrocks of Sharia? The answer, in my opinion, lies not only with an exclusively feminist undertaking, for in the history of Hadith itself, the sciences of textual criticism and ilm al-rijal, or biographical scrutiny for authenticity, are as old as the subject of Hadith. And a more scrupulous return to these endeavors, as called for by Sheikh Taha Jabir al-Wani, would inevitably lead to what Sheikh calls for, that is, a radically different construction of religious anthropology, which will not merely fit women into a male paradigm, but rather transform the entire framework so as to respect the fullness of human experience. Islamic legal thinking, on the other hand, about women is certainly the field that has suffered most from the two phenomena of literist, literalist reduction and cultural projection. Of the few work which have, works which have delved into fiqh literature, Kisha Ali's Sexual Ethics and Islam is perhaps the most useful in discerning a way to go about critiquing fiqh. She asked the important question, if I do not accept the sole interpretive authority of the juristic and exegetical heritage, which is strongly patriarchal and sometimes misogynist, why not bypass it entirely and turn to the Quran alone as a guide? This is indeed what many feminists have done, and in doing so have, have established yet another intellectual elitism. As Ali asserts, the legal methodology offers legitimacy for a flexible approach to the Quran and Sunnah by demonstrating the ways in which authorities have, from the earliest years of Islam, used their own judgment and customs of their times to adapt Quranic and prophetic dictates to change circumstances. The contemporary world would have much to gain by employing the same strategies for the promotion of equality between the sexes. Having said this, it is important to note the dramatic shift of authority in both majority Muslim and non-Muslim countries regarding law and legal matters. Muslims who are now living in post-traditional context are under no coercion to follow any particular school of thought or legal opinion. And so any discussion on fiqh and gender must take into account the diverse context and circumstances, whether social, economic, or political, that Muslims live in today. Muslims living in the secular West, for example, where gender equality is theoretically, at least, an accepted norm, could have a far easier time advocating for a gender-sensitive fiqh than Muslims living in Saudi Arabia, where fiqh, as articulated by Wahhabi interpretations, are embedded in the national law itself. Promoting gender-sensitive fiqh in such a context would necessarily also involve challenging political and economic hierarchies. It may seem that I am sitting on the fence here, not denouncing nor identifying with Muslim feminists, for I do feel that critical engagement with new scholarship is vital for progress. Whilst I agree that the classical fiqh, as male-centric and a product of its time, has othered the female to some extent, it would be an injustice to the rich and varied tradition to outrightly dismiss it. People lose touch with whole realms of experience and meaning, which has nourished for generations, but which are now slipping out of reach through this attitude. The classical jurists displayed in many instances, despite themselves, an objectivity towards women. There are sufficient examples which can form a point of departure for gender-sensitive fic, especially in methodology, 
Examples of this can be found in the treatment of ibadat, where concerted effort was made to include women as far as possible in ritual life. I propose, therefore, an idea born in conversation with Sheikh Siraj, Fiqh and Nisa. Fiqh here meant to refer to broader understanding, which would include the best of what the classical legacy has to offer women, without entering into apologetics for the views of the classical fuqaha. Fiqh and Nisa would move away from this trend completely, while not severing ties with the classical tradition. It, would be, it is possible to be both critical and loyal to the past without contradictions. A Fiqh and Nisa could be placed directly in the category of reconciling Islam and modernity. However, this is not without two critiques. The first being that it would not adopt a condescension of posterity attitude in judging past movements and ideas according to current value systems. And secondly, it would not simply accept the notion of Islam and modernity as being compatible or modernity as inevitable without questioning its structural weaknesses, especially a different kind of objectification of women, for example, through over-sexualization in the media. The state, economy, and the rise of a hegemonic monoculture pose an even greater threat to modern life than tradition. Entire populations turn spiritually and morally decayed, progressively hollow and vacuous, unable to, dis to distinguish what is valuable from what is valueless. A thick Anissa, whilst grounding itself squarely in the 21st century, would embrace modernity critically, by returning to tradition, not in order to stay there, but to bring tradition onward in such a way as to interrupt, not sustain, the cliches and complacencies of the contemporary. It is true that the once prevailing traditions hold biases and partialities we would not consider acceptable, but tradition has been essential to human life for millennia. Its key purpose has been to deliver the values, beliefs, and guidelines for conduct that have helped shape communities into organ organic totals. It has also been the critical force providing linkage from one generation to the next. Fiqh and Nisa would take into consideration the immense heritage of the classical legacy in linking the Islam of the earliest Muslims to us now, without romanticizing tradition, for to do so often does violence to past suffering by holding up as exemplary much that should be deplored, but rather acknowledging and exploiting the best of what it has to offer. Whilst Islamic feminism has focused on the Quran and Hadith as primary means to establish equality of the sexes from within an Islamic worldview, the fiqh has remained relatively untouched and hence in the practical aspects of Muslim women's lives, unchanged. A fiqh and Nisa, whilst radically proposing equality, would do so from within the lens of a classical fiqh methodology. A cautionary note is needed here in that if such a fic, if limited to the spheres of marriage, divorce, and inheritance, for example, would only add to the problem of female marginalization in Islamic epistemology. It would therefore not be a fic about, about women as such, <coughs> although matters involving women directly would be a significant component, but a fic by women, contributing to all the furu. The voices of Muslim women are crucial in matters like extremism, economics, and ibadat. How, what do Muslim women as lawmakers think about jihad, for example? Or how do they relate to economic structures at, as participants and producers in the economy? There is a notable consistency in fiqh. The jurists displayed remarkable integrity in the way they formulated law. And a rewriting of fiqh from a gender-sensitive perspective would mean a reconceptualization. At the heart of this proposed tajdeed is the issue of female leadership. A prime example of moving forward with this attitude has been articulated by Dr. Ingrid Mattison, a remarkable example of the middle way who stresses the importance of female, lead of female religious leadership. In other words, why does women's religious leadership matter? She argues that, in her experience, the main reason this is an issue of concern for many Muslim women is that they feel that religious authority has too often been used to suppress them. It is the rare Muslim woman who has not had some experience of being excluded from the mosque, having had to listen to demeaning sermons, or having been subjected to patronizing marriage counseling by religious leaders. This does not mean that this is the dominant experience of all Muslim women. There are, of course, many competent male religious leaders who are sensitive to women's experiences and listen to their counsel and their concerns. When few or no women in a community have recognized spiritual authority or positions of leadership, however, there is a good chance that the women of that community will experience religious authority negatively. This is a serious matter because it defeats the very purpose of religious, of the very purpose of religious institutions, whose primary purpose is to bring people closer to God. We need to be conscious of the unfortunate reality that institutions, including religious institutions, often develop in ways that lead them to defeat the very purposes they were created to serve. In many cases, Muslim women feel that restrictions placed upon them in the name of Islam are unjust, but they have neither the fluency in the Islamic legal discourse nor the religious authority to convincingly argue their objections. There are those who are convinced that men are capable of guiding and leading the, com the Muslim community in a just manner without female peers. 
I would argue that common sense tells us that even the most compassionate and insightful group of men will overlook some of the needs and concerns of the women in their community. More compellingly, experience teaches us that when women are not in leadership positions in their communities, they are often assigned inadequate prayer spaces, if any, they are cut off from much vital religious education, and they have few means to access the rights they possess in theory. There are many, Muslim, there are many reasons why women's leadership is important. The most important one for Muslim women is that they will not be prevented by being blocked from the sacred texts or houses of worship and study, from accessing the liberating message of obedience to God alone. This brings me then to the issue of women Muslims, Muslim women's religious participation and leadership in the South African context. I am aware that I am speaking to a somewhat enlightened community in Cape Town, either by way of madhahib or culture, on the topic of women and sacred space, referring to the Masajid and the Eid Musallah. However, for the most part, Muslim women in South Africa are disadvantaged by not being included in these sacred spaces through culturally and religiously unsound attitudes. How do we wanting to move forward as a community navigate through, these, through issues such as these? The past few years have seen many fatawa being brandished back and forward from both camps, articles, radio interviews, and smear campaigns. Are we to simplify the issue on the basis of madhahib and claim an end to the discussion, or claim that women involved in these campaigns are Western feminists, apologists, or liberals? A more dynamic approach is in order. Understanding that in a specifically South African context, a mindset where women are given every freedom, but denied the right to enter and participate in sacred space is inherently flawed. The need for women to feel part of a community and to identify as part of a religious tradition is strong, particularly in a minority context. It is my belief that in order to renew women's, and by extension society's, commitment to Islamic values of modesty, moderation, and spirituality, women's re-entry into the realm of, the, of sacred space is key. The insistence by many scholars that this is absolutely haram is not in line with the flexibility and dynamism of Islamic law. Women have been and are participating in the creation and distribution of knowledge in South Africa. I need not cite the many uh, examples of work done in Cape Town by so many committed Muslim women, which I'm sure you are all familiar with, but I do wish to highlight the work of three Muslim women in other parts of the country. The first being women's scholarship, as undertaken by Sister Quraysh Suleiman in Johannesburg. Her tireless efforts to educate women about their rights, from marriage to hijab and the masjid and Eid prayer issue, has seen so many women recommit to their religious beliefs. The second is a prime example of women's leadership, displayed by Sister Fatima Asma, director of the Ilm Essay Institute in Durban, who organizes conferences and workshops which always include women as participants and speakers, runs social welfare and dawah programs and fundraising for the underprivileged, as well as her biannual Eid prayer events, which invite families to participate in the special prayers. She has also produced a documentary which actually aired this morning, which delves into changing Muslim identity in South Africa, promoting progressive and balanced views of Islam in the South African context. My third example is a political and civil society engagement by Khadija Patel, an award-winning journalist. Her participation in the public eye received much atten attention. Her commentary on the Arab Spring, sports reporting, and political, political lobbying on the issue of Palestine has earned her a place in the media elite. Her article on hijab was re recently featured in Elle magazine, a mainstream fashion publication. This feat alone is tremendous for the perceptions of Muslim women in broader society. All these women through their activities have served to break down stereotypes, seek justice, end discrimination, and promote reform. In the South African context, we are fortunate that our constitution affords us both, the both freedom of religion and gender equality. And as Muslim women, we can use both of these to the best of their potential. We are free to wear the hijab, work, study, and fight for our rights to sacred space without fear of persecution. The last issue I wish to comment on is that of the family. The family in Islam, and also in most cultures, is the foundation and bedrock of society. For the smooth functioning of the family, not only do we need women of the middle way, but men of the middle way as well. It was Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, a truly radical scholar of the middle way, who said, biology should be destiny, but a destiny that allows for multiple possibilities. Yes, women are biologically created for childbirth and lactation. However, this does not and should not place them at a disadvantage to participate in society, as Muslim women have been for centuries. Were it not for this balanced attitude towards family responsibilities, I certainly would not have been here today sharing these thoughts with you, as my husband cares for our five-month-old twins. It is within the ambit of the prophetic sunnah to share the responsibilities of the household so that all members may thrive as active members of society and engage in the pursuit of higher education, financial independence, and most importantly, eternal salvation. At the core of all these issues is a strong need for a return to spirituality. As mothers, wives, scholars, students, activists, professionals, and the myriad of other roles women occupy, we cannot forget that our sole purpose on this earth, beyond raising children, making a living, and seeking gender justice, is to serve Allah. 
The realm of the soul offers for women a respite from the world of materialism and misogyny, where the emphasis is on the ungendered ego or nafs. Here I draw upon, upon a concept again learned from Sheikh Siraj, that is the Sunnah of Allah. Allah's Sunnah is one in which the natural order of creation is a reflection of his own disposition. He created human beings from his nature, as the Quran, Surah 30, verse 30 states, adhere to the fitrah of Allah upon which he has created all people. Fitrah is a concept which refers to the natural constitution with which a child is created in a mother's womb, natural, native, innate. The Quran also states, O mankind, reverence your guardian Lord who created you from a single person, created of like nature his mate, and from then twain scattered like seeds countless men and women. Reverence God through whom you demand your mutual rights and reverence the wombs that bore you, for God ever watches over you. Human beings in their fidraic nature are also created in the, from the same essence. Reverencing the womb is equated with reverencing Allah. The Sunnah of Allah consequentially demands that the natural constitution of men and women are both normative and to be well regarded. In conclusion, who is the woman in the middle? She is captured, in my opinion, perfectly by Professor Tariq Ramadan's words. The woman of the middle way is one who wishes to recapture the message's coherence, but also to find a way to face the challenges of modern times while remaining faithful to principles and founding objectives. Her aim is to seek justice and discrimination and promote reform. She is faithful to the message without fearing to disturb social frameworks, power relationships, and the traditional roles placed on women as a result of partial understanding of this beautiful message. Shukran. <laughs>